Top 100 mailbag episode here on the call up. I'm Arm Layton. He's Jack McMullen. And we have a lot of questions about the top 100 list. We've been wanting to do this for a little bit, be able to answer specific questions that you may have on why certain players were ranked in certain spots. Although we didn't really get as many about that. It was more just specific players that people wanted us to talk about. So we're going to do that. Eight questions. We'll probably fit in a few other little things here and there, but eight really good ones. Thank you to everyone who took the time to ask those questions. And if you didn't get featured in this one, we'll be sure to try to get as to as many questions as we can uh, in future mailbags. We'll be doing at least once a month. And remember, of course, for the subscription-based episodes, which are linked in the episode description, we will make sure in those mailbags as well that we're doing every month for the bonus episodes to get to every single question uh, from subscribers too, in case you really want to get yours in. Jack, you helped compile, you pretty much compiled all of these questions so far and, and you know, put these eight together. How are we feeling about the uh, the crop that we've got here and, and topics? I feel like they're wide ranging. A lot of great topics, wide ranging topics. Uh, last year's draft is certainly a, a focal point of mm -hmm. this group of questions. And I think last year's draft is as good as like we've seen in, in quite some time. And I think that's an indication of where baseball is at as a game. I think this year's draft is going to be electric and, you know, one through 20, 25 in this coming draft are all going to be, you know, guys that should be considered top 10 prospects in whatever organization that they fall to. So um, I don't know. I think we're in a really good spot. And I think these questions are indicative of the spot that we're at and they want to ask about the new shiny toys that yeah. they have in their org instead of like, Hey, we're on year five of the Mick Abel experience. How's that going? And we'll get to Mick Abel because he is an yeah. answer to one of the questions that we got, but yeah, it was, it was fun. It, I, th I think just kind of seeing the, the way that the audience is kind of swayed us, or at least is like wanted to direct us in terms of topics. You're kind of seeing that changing of the guard prospect wise. Of course, you're going to have those graduates and you're going to have players that naturally um, are going to no longer be on the prospect list. But I feel like even those guys that have been around for a little bit that are still near the top of the prospect list uh, are, are not getting as many questions. I think a lot of people, like you said, are excited about some of these newer and shinier prospects that I think are going to start to fly through the minors even quicker than, than what we're used to. And kind of leads us into the first question, which is a new and shiny prospect in Seattle. They got several of them, but mm -hmm. it's Colt Emerson. And the question is, I know you guys have Colt Emerson at 46. Do you guys see him moving up the list by the end of the year? And that comes from J Pow one, two, three, and then four spelled out. So it's one, sorry, one, two, three, four. And then he spells out four on nice. Twitter. That's a, that's a, it's a nice little uh, uh, tongue twister there, I guess. So a little bit of a brain game there, but yeah. good question. I've seen, I've been getting a lot of questions. I feel like we have both been getting a lot of questions about Colt Emerson and understandably. So one of the younger guys in that class, had a ridiculous 26 game stretch. If you include the postseason in his pro debut, uh, yeah. shows up 15 pounds heavier in a good way, and people are always going to get you know even more hyped about the best shape of my life type of thing, especially for a guy that's gonna be 18, 19 years old. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at it like naturally he's gonna jump because you're gonna have graduates, and we're gonna talk about the graduates and what that means for new new prospects potentially coming in. But I think just trying to kind of eliminate that side of it and just say, okay, if he's 36 right now and we're presuming 10 names ahead of him graduate or, or something around there, like, do we see him leapfrogging? I think the names ahead of him, I think is more of the specific way to look at the question because naturally the younger prospects are going to climb if they keep maintaining their performance and other prospects are graduating. I kind of zero right in on the names ahead of them. And again, I'm skipping the Jared Joneses and those players that are, you know, going to graduate and just kind of looking at the Jet Williams of the world, mm -hmm. the Emmanuel Rodriguez's of the world, the Carson Williams, who we have a question on as well. Yeah. Those guys are balling out to start the season too. Yeah. So I, I like, yes, he's going to climb, but I'm struggling to see who he jumps over when you look at the names that are ahead that aren't going to just graduate. So nobody's jumping Emmanuel Rodriguez right now. <laughs> Emmanuel Rodriguez is jumping others. He's hitting the crap out of the ball and he's not swinging at bad pitches, which is the best version of Emmanuel Rodriguez with Colt Emerson. I, I think the conversation is interesting because I immediately hear that group and I say, Oh, like he's going to jump Jed Williams. Colt Emerson has not been playing a great defensive shortstop from what I've seen. And he's hitting the ball really hard, right? And he's big. I'm almost like 
worried that he's going to show too poorly at short to really skyrocket up this list. And Mm -hmm. if you hit, you jump. If you hit, you jump. But I think the end all for him could be shortstop defense. If he looks like a guy that can stick at short, I think just like trying to get inside your brain, you would have no problem making this guy a top 25 prospect in baseball. Yeah. If he looks the part at shortstop and he's hitting the crap out of the ball in the lower levels. But that just doesn't seem to be the case at short. Like all the video that I've gotten to see, um, all these Modesto broadcasts that I've gotten to see, <laughs> it, it doesn't look like smooth. And mm-hmm. that's my concern there. Yeah. I mean, I was hoping because, you know, I, I saw the ingredients, you know, you, you see like kind of what he's got going there. You think, OK, well, he can progress into, you know, passable shorts. I mean, I still I still think he can. But I think you bring up a really good point because he puts on a little bit more weight. Uh, you know, I think that the power is going to continue to to grow for him. And we're already seeing him hit the ball pretty hard for an 18 year old. He's not going to be 19 until the end of July, which is nuts. Uh I, I do feel like if he is moving to your point off of short, I, I don't think that that decimates his his value, but it does put more pressure on the bat. It means yeah. that we're going to need to see that bat go nuclear to really climb up the ranks. If you look at our top prospect list, you're not going to see very many third basemen there. Right, The only third baseman that you're going to see – at the top of the list is, is junior Camonero. And yeah. that is the definition of nuclear offense, by the way, welcome back to junior first game back off the IL Homer one eleven and a double the other way. Um, so great to see him back, but you know, you, you look at what that does. The other, the other third baseman in the top 20 Kobe Mayo, that's the definition of nuclear offensive ability. So it puts pressure on the bat. Can I, can I give you the comp inside the top 20? I sure. think he's a younger version of Colson Montgomery. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The same questions that we're asking about Colson yeah. Montgomery. We're asking about Colt Emerson, what, four years earlier, three and a half years earlier mm-hmm. than we are about Colson. And Colson has a way more advanced bat at this point. And uh, allegedly he's knocking on the door of the big leagues. Like, would he get blown up up there right now? I think so, maybe, but he's in triple A at this he's point. He's also six four. And right, you can right, probably right. dream on even more power with with uh you know, with the Colson. And I think that's the side of it too. Um, I have concerns that Colson ends up moving to third. And I think it's a great parallel to draw there. Uh, but, you know, Colson's field of hits insane for a guy that's that big. Yeah. And, and, but to the point of seeing Emerson rise, Colson Montgomery rose and it wasn't because of his shortstop defense. It wasn't because, no. Oh, he really looks like he's going to stick there. I think he's made some improvements, but it, it wasn't something that's like, Oh, slam dunk. He looks like, you know, the, the five tool shortstop. It was more, wow, he's 6'4 and making that much contact. Whoa, look at those flashes to the pole side. And I think yeah. Colson, you know, is that's what makes him so fun. I think with Colt Emerson, it's it's similar where you're going to see like, wow, look at that field of hit for a teenager. Oh, man, he's he's running into some baseballs too. He's got some juice, but he's six foot and kind of already he's putting on that strength. And I don't know how much more room there is in that frame where you look at a Colson Montgomery and you're like, that's like a Corey Seager offensive profile yeah. you can dream yeah. on. So I think Colt can rise, but I see him more as a guy that is just going to maintain. And by maintaining, he climbs because yeah. we already have him really high. You know, I think you're going to see him climb on other ranks. I think we're one of the higher on him at 46. I think but- BA's got him in the 50s. I think Prospectus might have him in the 50s too. But yeah. I mean, again, same deal like, He'll look like a big riser for them, and he'll look like a riser for us too, but I'm with you. Maintaining is rising with graduations preceding him. Exactly, because I think you're more just like fighting off the guys behind you and to like wrap up on it. You know, you just look at some of the prospects behind him, and, you know, I feel really good about his ability to fight those players off, and I think that's kind of what's going to allow him to keep climbing up those ranks and and crack that top 30. But like a Kyle Manzardo – I like him a lot. I don't see him leapfrogging a Colt Emerson if Emerson maintains. Mick Abel, who's in the top 50, you know, he, he looks solid. We're going to talk about him later, but I don't see him leapfrogging. Um, even a Dalton rushing looks fantastic out of the gate. I could see it potentially, but I would still side with Emerson just because of the youth and, and what we're already seeing from him offensively. So kind of looking at the names behind him, it's going to take a huge leap from, you know, a Tommy Troy, who we're going to talk about, a Brady House, a, a Tamar Johnson. I, I, I think those guys are less likely to make that leap than Colt Emerson just maintaining. And I think Emerson, at the very least, is going to maintain. I don't think he makes this massive jump this year, 
But if he keeps doing what we've seen, which is just hit and look polished at the plate, and you know, we'll see if the glove is is wishy washy. I still think he he holds that spot, and we see him in you know the top thirty five or so by the time we get to our next update and clear out some of those names that have uh, exceeded the prospect limits. I'm excited to do that, by the way, because uh, we're going to get a nice little uh, rejuvenation here and a new number one and all that good stuff. That's going to be a lot of fun to talk about, but any final thoughts on Emerson before we move on to question number two? I don't think so. Just be amped about the excitement that, that we've got with the nuts go nuts for the nuts. nuts. Um, Yeah. Emerson, Farmello, Pete and Laz. Holy hell. Yeah. Fun. Must watch, must watch television right now, uh, whether it's moon landing footage or not. Right. Question number two. I knew we were going to get this one, so might as well, might as well get to it on number two. Mm -hmm. Are we ready to put Skeens as the clear top pitching prospect in the game after his dominant start to the AAA season? That comes from at the real Brady 22 on Twitter. Jack, I'll let you kind of lead in on this one. And look, no pressure. You can say what you want. I know that I was the uh, vocal, not that you were against it, but I know I was the pusher of Job 1A, Skeens 1B. You can tell me if you think I'm wrong, but you've watched Skeens up close and personal. You also talked to him for 40 minutes, which by the way, amazing interview. If you have not listened to that yet, somehow, if you missed that in our feed, go listen to that. I wouldn't even care if you just closed out of this episode right now and went to go listen to that. That's better than what we're doing right now. Uh, but that was awesome. Really fun to listen to that. And and Skeens, I mean, just seemed like he was having a blast opening up and just talking about everything. But yeah. where are you at? I mean, you've, you've called multiple starts now of Paul Skeens. And yeah. we're going to talk, you know, it's a two-pronged question. I'm going to talk about Job's struggles, quote unquote, you know, it's relative yeah. out of the gate. But I mean, Skeens has been the best pitching prospect so far. So I get that. Where are you at? So nine and a third, three hits, no runs, two walks, 19 punch outs for Skeens in his first three. I don't necessarily think this question actually pops up if Job isn't struggling the way he is. So I I think we're seeing a guy dominate at AAA and a guy that's also 21 years old really falter in AA, first two starts. And you're saying, well, how's the guy faltering in AA ahead of the guy excelling in AAA? And I, I think coming into the year, the argument was absolutely there. And yeah, I I validated your thoughts because when you sit here in the offseason and you watch what these guys did, like Skeens was not good in his double A appearance last year. He yep. it, it didn't happen for him. And you know, there was a lot of traffic and there were hits, there were walks, like it was not good. But it was also six minor league innings. And that's yeah. the sample that we had to work with. Jackson Job on his way back from injury, it was like he punched out what 84 and he walked six. Yeah. Like, we got to remember the difference in success here. And obviously, Skeens had thrown 122 innings in college and all that. Yeah, great. I I do think the start that I've seen from Skeens is enough to like fully convince me that he's the best pitching prospect in baseball because like everything that Job does is awesome. And sitting here in the offseason, like it felt like Job might've just been more advanced with who he was as a pitcher because he's been in pro ball for now two years and Skeens was in pro ball for three weeks. Yeah. Having said that, I viewed that I think as a knock on Skeens a couple months ago. And now I view it as a pro for Skeens because he's just scraping the surface of who he Mm -hmm. can be. And we're talking about a guy that is arguably the best pitching prospect in baseball. And he's making triple a hitters look like 15 year olds he made yeah. Lars newt bar look like a 17 u guy it yeah. was so crazy to watch and I, I think utter domination pushes me to that point that Skeens is the number one pitching prospect in baseball but i i just want to validate like the argument was absolutely there to be had when this list came out yeah you know like i'm not going to you know i'm ready to adjust when we get a bit larger of a sample and I'll be honest and say, you know, Hey, um, I'm noticing this with Job and I'm noticing this with Skeens and this is what's different than what I thought going into the year. And and one thing that's already different with Skeens than I thought going into the year is, well, one, that's Splinker. Uh, You know, we had not really seen that pitch utilized. 
the way that it ha- has and just really used period the way that Skeens is using it. Uh, that's a total game changer. The other thing was, you know, this, it, all he had was that sweeper. And now we're seeing, and he talked about it in that interview with you, like the, the iterations of the slider that I think give him multiple looks as well. So my concern was, okay, fastball that he's, and not even concerned. It's just like, we're trying to split hairs here. I thought he was fastball be a that he's, guy. Yeah. Yeah. And when I thought the changeup was good enough to be a third pitch, but it's like that sprinkle it in, take him off of the, the one, two rhythm. It's not that at all. And, and beyond that, <clears throat> the slider is multifaceted. Um, the fastball looks even a little bit better in terms of the way that he's able to locate it, the way it's playing at the top of the zone. And then he has a splinker. That said, Job, I think we're, we're overreacting. I think some people are overreacting to two starts so far at the double A level. Remember, these are this is his second and third start at the double A level. He had one outing there at the end of last year where he went six shutty, no walk, six Ks. We're also talking about a guy that last year, you mentioned the walk to the strikeout to walk rate, like over the course of the entire season, he struck out 103, including rehabs and stuff in Arizona fall league, struck out 103, walked 11. Yeah. Like I'm going to side with that sample over two starts at the beginning of the season in cold weather. And this was in Harrisburg and then in, in Erie. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't really feel like we can take any major, you know, anything major from this. The other side of it is his fastball is performing as well as Skeens is. And I know it's different competition, but if you look at the life on it, you look at the characteristics, you look at the whiff rates within the zone, he's dominating with the fastball. The problem for Job has been the feel for the secondaries. And again, I don't know if that's a weather a- aspect. It could uh, be. It could be. this The, the changeup, which was there for him all last year and became a an absolute weapon. It was better than a slider for him down the stretch last year. He's only thrown 22 of them because that's actually a fair amount because he's only thrown 119 pitches, but he's only thrown 10 for a strike. I just don't think that's going to keep happening. The slider when it's around the zone has been dominant, but he's only landed that for a strike 55% of the time. The cutter that he was putting wherever he wanted last year, he's thrown 14 of them, only seven for a strike. So we're looking at a guy that, again, the fastball strike rate is 70% and he's dominating within the zone, getting chased with it. Like the fastball is performing like the 70 pitch that, you know, I think it can be. And that was the other thing that kind of sold me on Job was, hey, that fastball, it may not be 100. He can touch 100. It's 97 to 99 with better, I think, characteristics. I I don't subscribe to the major characteristic conversation with Skeens, but if we're splitting hairs on fastballs, 98 with really good characteristics you know, can start to close that gap a little bit. What we're seeing with Skeens, though, is he has some built-in deception that is really hard to quantify via track man. And you can really only quantify via via the eyeballs of hitters who have faced him. And that's why I think hitter testimony is so important yeah. when we can get that on pitching prospects because otherwise we're just, you know, we can get too deep into the lull of, you know, hey, track man data, this is what I see, this is what I saw in person, and go off of that. Jackson Holiday's Tony, it looks 110, then it looks fucking 110. (laughs) Yes, bingo. And I mean, seeing the way that some of these really talented AAA hitters are swinging the bat against Paul Skeens is it's it's so hard to like wrap my brain around because these are guys that are incredibly talented baseball players. Jacob Herdeby's had a 950 OPS last year. And yeah. he like sorted. That dude doesn't sort ever. And he sorted at 101 at the top of the zone. The other thing that you got to note with Skeens is he's been utterly insane. He's been the best pitcher in minor league baseball to this point. If he had these numbers at the major league level right now, even if he was going three inning starts, we'd be talking about this guy as a Cy Young candidate. Yeah. Yeah. But, no, it's fair. No, I know. But I will also say he hasn't thrown more than 55 pitches in an outing yet. He went three innings, three innings, three and a third. He literally threw one pitch in the fourth inning in Toledo last week. So, you know, like these are things that you have to acknowledge. Like, and and listen, he <laughs> listening to Skeens converse with us. He wants to throw into the seventh. He wants oh. to throw into the eighth right now. Yeah, his employer's not letting him, and it's frankly it's hard for people to have immense takeaways about a starting pitcher when they're only going three innings and fifty five pitches at this point. So yeah. it's very very early, but just based on the domination of Skeens and like 
you know, the, the six innings worth of struggles from Jackson Job. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think Skeens is probably the best pitching prospect in baseball right now, but again, like this can constantly change. It That's always the fluctuates. Thing. It's always going to fluctuate. Um, There's a reason they were one, a and one B like they were yeah, right next to each other in this. Yeah. It, and again, I like to get, I would never go to war with somebody saying Skeens is ahead of him. Like I, I, I think you could go either way. Uh, but I do think that before kind of making any, major adjustment you know we need a larger sample and yeah. that's why you know i will let you guys know when when i think this needs adjusting uh and you know if the command issues continue with jackson job then absolutely uh but i just i struggle to believe a guy that had some of the best command in the minor leagues last year is just going to lose that all of a sudden uh just because of two starts where yeah he, he didn't have it the last thing i'll mention on on job is Despite walking seven through those five and two thirds innings, yeah. he's mostly kept runs off the board, uh, and you know, which is nuts. And he did the second or the first outing, he got screwed. We talked about kind of like all of the the things that happened to him in that outing, um, and then you know, in this last one, he only gave up one hit. The problem was the four walks, but it was one hit. He struck out five, so the stuff's there. He's been walking a tightrope. I think if he starts to recalibrate. I think we're going to see him go through some torrid stretches here. And then all of a sudden it's right back to square one. And, and people will be asking us the same question all over again. Uh, but right now with Skeen's domination, I can totally understand why people would lean that way. Yeah. Question number three, Carson Williams. It's mm -hmm. been fun to see another, another guy that's just been, I mean, we're high on him for obvious reasons, but also is just such a confusing player to monitor uh, in the race system. But you got to be, intrigued with what he's doing so far 37th overall prospect for us in that top 100 list and you know this is a guy that if he keeps doing what he's doing right now it's extremely early you know he's poised to climb the question is Carson Williams is having a good start at double a with better control to his k percentage is it a minor blip or legitimate gain in his contact rate that comes from charlie's on twitter spelled ch4r-l-e-y-s always some great interaction uh, with him on on Twitter, uh, one of my favorite uh, back and forths with you know folks that, that follow us on Twitter, um, just always always have some great questions or just uh, conversation. So thank you again for for the question for the mailbag. It's a great question and one that you know I can't confidently answer yet. You know it'd be disingenuous if I'm just like, oh yeah, it looks different and he looks better. We've talked about it like I, we haven't really seen a, a major tangible adjustment from him setup wise or and I don't think he really needs it. It's more of just the sequencing and how he can get himself to stay closed longer, not pull off with the front side, repeat some of his moves, recognize breaking balls better. Like it to me, it just felt like it was going to be something that just comes with accumulation of at bats and understanding of his body. So I always felt like with Carson Williams, we were just talking about on the Just Baseball show, MJ Melendez and, you know, why he's having such a great start to the year. And that's a guy that made some physical changes to his swing, his setup and his load. And now you're seeing results. I felt like he could always kind of needed that. Carson Williams doesn't really need that. Maybe he does to, to help him stay on the ball. Maybe there's some cues he needs. I don't know. But for me, I always felt like with him, it was going to be a slower burn, just kind of learning, getting acclimated and just developing naturally. Um, maybe there is a cue that he'll find in his setup to help him with that, but I don't necessarily think he needs that. I, again, I just think it's reps. So maybe these are the reps breaking through. Maybe this is a full off season, an Arizona fall league, a, a spring training, and now just getting going here where we're starting to see the reps break through. But we also got some looks in spring training where it's like, ah, you know, it looks like the same Carson Williams. But then every once in a while, he'd look like a different version of that. I think that just might be par for the course with this guy. I think he is going to be a volatile player. Maybe the difference is the, the valleys are, are brought up a little bit. Right. And then, you know, those, those like big, I guess the exciting stretches that you have, the spikes are a little bit higher and the divots are a little bit higher as well. And all of a sudden he settles in at a higher overall, you know, slash line at the end of the year. But I think he's just always going to be volatile. Probably. He, he He's blossoming into more complete of a player like each time you check in, it seems. And what I mean by that is like clearly he's always been a really good defender. 
but it, it does feel like he's becoming more comfortable with who he is in terms of identity each go around. He was 19 years old and he spent the entire year in low A Charleston. He struck out all the time. He mm-hmm. sold out for power. No 19 year old chef, 19 homers in the South Atlantic league. Like that's not a good place to hit, but he had him. He got caught on the bases all the time. Mm-hmm. Then last year, it's pretty much an identical season, just a level higher. And again, he got caught on the bases all the time. He had way more homers than a 20 year old should have in the Midwest league, or I guess they're in the, uh, there's Bowling Green now. Bowling Green would be. Should be Midwest, no? No, they're not anymore. Carolina League, I don't know what it's called now. They There was just some weird realignment with Bowling Green. But, again, another pitcher-friendly environment, and he puts up kind of the same thing, where he hits more homers than he should as a guy that young. He gets caught on the bases too much. He strikes out too much, but he's a great mm-hmm. defender. Now, and it's very early, but it seems like he's picking his spots as a base dealer better. He's four for five in that going. He's going to hit his homers, but it, it just seems like he's more willing to be who he is in the batter's box instead of like, I'm going to hit this ball 115 miles an hour, which is very cool. I think that's an important note, and it kind of ties into the, uh, like, just – I guess the volatility, you know, the the good stretches and the bad stretches. What are some ways to manage your bad stretches? Walk, continue to play great defense, provide value on the base paths. And these are all things that I think you can absolutely do. It's small sample through seven games, but even when we were watching him live, he's always been pretty selective, but now he's been extremely selective. And I think it's it's important because look, the hit tool may improve. But it's never going to be good. He's never going to be a, a bat to ball guy. Right. Uh, and he's probably never even going to be an average hit tool guy. It's going to be fringy at best. So if you're a fringy hit tool guy, you know you've got good power that you can get into consistently in games. How do you manage the inconsistency? How do you try to become more consistent? It's cut down on the chase, right? Okay, breaking balls, he was whiffing at a, you know, a, a pretty high clip in the zone. Recognize them better. Be more selective. And that's exactly what he's done so far. Crush the hangers, spit on you know the borderline ones. If they locate a few good breaking balls in an at bat, you tip your cap. But he crushes fastballs, he always has. So if he's more selective, continues to crush fastballs, marginally improves his ability to hit breaking balls. And then, you know, I think with a large, I think it takes a pretty large step forward in terms of his ability to lay off breaking balls. That's going to put together a more well rounded hitter without making a major leap in the hit tool department. And I think that's what we could be seeing here in the early going. Hasn't been striking out, has been walking as much as really ever against some of the better arms he's, he's seen. I, I Again, early, not going to change my perspective just yet because we kind of have him baked in as a guy that would hopefully be doing this at this point. Mm-hmm. But I do think that you're kind of seeing maybe the beginning of a guy that's starting to shore up, as you mentioned, that profile yeah. and if he does that he can get away with being a 35 40 hit tool guy if he's a better base runner like you said if he's walking way more if he's more selective against secondaries and continues to be the elite defender that we see you know he's going to continue to grow into more power which yeah. is just going to allow him to miss hit baseballs that get out of the yard i think we're starting to see it all come together he's 20 years old yeah he's he's closer to achieving his final form than really we've ever seen him before and i think that's an important note with him. Yes. We're going to get to question number four, which is a Tommy Troy question in a moment before that, a quick break. All right. Another question from one of my favorites and you picked these, so you don't even know who, who some of my favorite interactions are on mm-hmm. Twitter, but Naoki baseball nerd. I met him out in the Arizona fall league with his father. He is the man uh, and always asks great questions. High school kid that is just dialed in on the prospects. I absolutely loved that stuff and then absolutely love seeing um such a knowledgeable high school kid just so passionate about it while still playing himself so shout out to naoki baseball nerd um i love him owning the baseball nerd side of things as well Mm -hmm. and uh thanks again for for the question what is the ceiling of tommy troy of the d-backs is it an all-star this is a fun one because the reason why tommy troy kind of jumped on our list 
He's number 55 on our top 100. The reason why he jumped on our list was when I went back and watched more of his pro debut, I saw a guy that I think we talked about it, but a guy that did not see his power take a hit nearly as much as I thought it would when going from metal to wood. And I still thought that he'd have average power with, with um, wood, but honestly, he was hitting the ball even harder than I thought. And he's not off to the best start so far. It's six games in. But just seeing the way he was barreling baseballs with with wood, because he's not the biggest guy in the world. He's like 5'10, 195 pounds. And we talked about like Braden Taylor and you know how that potentially what some people saw was above average power it could trend back closer to average when he's swinging with wood. And I thought Troy could kind of be cut from that same cloth. But then we see the stretch of pro ball where he's hitting the ball really hard with wood. He's starting to elevate a little bit more. He's going the other way with authority, hitting balls 107, 108 miles an hour pretty consistently the other way. And I'm like, whoa, okay, you add the speed, uh, you, you add the approach and just the feel to hit. And I'm like, okay, this could be a really well-rounded and fun player. Yeah. To answer the question though, Jack, like all-star, I think it can be there. More likely if he plays like second base. <laughs> like, Because I, I think they're going to give him every opportunity at short. And, you know, he's actually shown better than I thought he would. But if he's a shortstop, he's an average defender there, you know, best. And it's a lot harder to be an all-star at that position. If he's at second base, so really, he'll probably be a really solid defender there. He'll probably provide an above-average pop there. And the field of hits really good. I could see him being an all-star at second, but, like, you also would probably rather him play shortstop if he's an average shortstop. It's really hard. I think he's a fringe all-star at like his 85th percentile outcome, like 80 to 90th percentile. Obviously, everybody in the top 100, their 100th percentile outcome is all-star uh -huh. and it's all-star consistently. So ceiling is tough because ceiling like, yeah, he can absolutely be an all-star. But for me, when I see a good version of Tommy Troy, when he gets up, it's a guy that you say is a damn solid everyday middle infielder. Yeah. And damn solid everyday middle infielders really don't make all-star teams consistently. Um, they make it in fluky years like Orlando Arcia. Yeah. I know it was kind of a pop-up year, but last year he was a damn solid everyday middle infielder. Um, I think about a Nico Horner. And I That's know who I was be, thinking about. Yeah, and it's going to be like different level of production because Nico doesn't have the pop that Troy has, but Troy doesn't have the speed or really like the defensive ability that Nico has. Or the um, bat to ball even. That bat to yeah. ball is just on a different level. That's a 70 so, hit tool. Right. So like it all kind of levels out, but I view Tommy Troy's ceiling in a, in a way similar to Nico Horner or Bryson Stott. Let's call it Stott too. Are Nico Horner and Stott all-stars? No. In the right year, yes. Mm -hmm. But on a year-by-year -year basis, we're not going to look at them and be like, oh, they were deserving of that all-star selection in eight of their seasons. That's not what's going to happen. So I, I think that he backdoors his way into a couple. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he ever starts an all-star game, but I think that that guy is viewed in a very similar light to Nico Horner and Bryson Stott. And frankly, that should fire you up if you're a yeah. that man. I think you just snapped on the Bryson Stott comp. I, like, I think that's really close to what it could look like for Tommy Troy. And remember, Stott probably a little better defensively. Like, I actually liked Stott's glove at short. But just kind of take that out of it because Stott's not playing second. He's a good, really solid defender there. And I think Troy could be a really solid defender there. I don't think it's going to be a big enough gap there. But Stott, you know, was always hit over power. And then I really fell in love with with Stott as he started to tap into more power. We saw it in the Arizona Fall League and everybody is always like, oh, but it's the AFL. But then I was looking at the batted ball data out there. I was like, no, 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 there, there's a difference here for Stott. Yeah. And I, it's kind of the same thing with Troy just earlier where it's like, okay, we knew he could hit. We knew he's, he's athletic. We knew the approach was going to be good enough. And that he's a high prob probability big leaguer. But then I start seeing Troy elevate a bit more, start seeing him you know, produce a little bit more in the EV department. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, this could be a well above average regular. I, I think Stott and Troy are, are you know, they're not – going to be they're not going to look the same but i think when you look at the production and the things that they do uh, i think it can end up kind of looking very similar and yeah. that's a good thing so all-star maybe a couple times but i also think all-star is such a tough way to and i i'm guilty of it. i throw it in the write-ups all the time but like all-star is such a tough way to like gauge a player because yeah. there's so much flukiness and you know, randomness that goes into the all-star. But I, I think it is just kind of also just gives us a barometer of 
where that player lines up. And I think yeah. fringe all-star is what Bryson Stott is. And I think fringe all-star is what Tommy Troy is. And usually if you're a fringe all-star long enough, you'll make a couple all-star games. Yeah. So I think that's where Tommy Troy ultimately settles in. Uh, and that should be, like you said, very exciting uh, for, for Diamondbacks fans because that's a heck of a player heck and you know, they don't grow on trees. Dude, every team wants a Bryson Stott. I'm telling you that yeah. right now. Absolutely. Number five, do you think that Chase Dolander can pan out even in Colorado with how notoriously bad their pitching development and environment is? That comes from at the batter's eye pod on Instagram. So, well, first of all, I'll have to reference that interview we did with Dolander uh, that we put out a week ago. He talks exactly about not the not the Rockies pitching development. Wasn't going to get into that with him, uh, but he does talk about the idea of going to pitch at altitude and you know how you know. I basically asked him like, "Do you think this is something that can negatively affect you?" And you know, what do you think about that when when it's all said and done? When you get up there, like, how do you feel about trying to throw up there? And he seemed very unconcerned. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he was very worried about that. Because in, in his words, he said, if I execute pitches that, you know, I know how good my stuff is. If I execute my pitches the way I'm supposed to execute them, I will get guys out. And I think he's probably gone back and looked at stretches of, you know, really dominant pitchers for a little bit, executing their pitches and succeeding at cores. I think the the cores effect is obviously it's very, very real. That's not a that's not a debate. But I think that the cores effect has been magnified by the fact that the Rockies just stink at identifying pitching mm -hmm. historically and then wheel out either non-finished products because they couldn't develop them well and or pitchers that just don't fit well in the environment. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways to find guys that fit the environment. We talk about funky lefties. That's what they're doing and they're finding plenty of them. Or you just find guys that have unreal stuff that it doesn't matter. And that's where Dolander lines up. He's also funky, so that helps. Like it's a it's a unique release, but it's just crazy stuff. So I think that one, the times are changing. The Rockies, all of a sudden, their scouting department is is as good as it's been in a long time. They're, I think, in terms of their development, it's not saying a lot, but it's as good as it's been in a long time. So that helps. Dolander is also the kind of guy that you draft and you just let him go. He figured out what was wrong with him in the offseason. He talked about that mechanically. He figured that out already. He adjusted his pitch shapes a little bit in the offseason. You don't need to mess with a Dolander. He will figure that stuff out. And now I feel like he's a guy that's just going to keep cruising. So we are totally aligned because as you were saying it, actually right before you said it, I pulled up the Wikipedia page of the Rockies' first-round picks by year. And I want you to stop me when you hear me say a name of a pitcher that is as talented as Chase Dolander is, or was as talented as Chase Dolander is. Their last pitcher that they took in the first round was 2022, Gabriel Hughes. They selected 10th overall. TJ, nowhere near as talented as Dolander. Then you go to Ryan Rollison in 2018. No. Robert Tyler out of the University of Georgia in 2016. No. Riley Pint, you know that story. It was, you know, like it, it has that has nothing to do with the altitude or really the pitching development. That was just a guy that couldn't really put it together and then, you know, dealt with with more stuff beyond that. Nothing. Then 2015, Mike Nickarak, Pennsylvania high schooler. 2014, Kyle Freeland. 2013, nice. John Gray. That's the one. If you don't remember how good John Gray was for a couple of years in Coors, I mean, you're – And Freeland. Freeland had some good stretches. Freeland, like Freeland was all right. Like, you know, the extension was, eh, I don't know. But John Gray, you got to remember, that guy signed a $56 million deal after he left Colorado. Yep. John Gray finished sixth in Rookie of the Year voting when he had a 4-6 in 2016. Then he made 20 starts in 2017, had a 3-7. Made – what through 150 innings in 2019 had a 3.8. That's excellent. Like when you look at ERA plus, John Gray had a 138 ERA plus in 2017, and in 2019 he had a 134 ERA plus. ERAs mm -hmm. are naturally going to be a little bit higher when Coors Field is your home ballpark. Yep. But Chase Dolander might be the first guy since John Gray, and frankly Marquez when he's healthy, 
that can put up an ERA sub four with Coors Field as his home ballpark. They Boy. had three very talented arms. Gray, yeah. who walked, Marquez, who's hurt, and Marquez seems perfectly okay with staying, and Dolander. <laughs> and I think that you have an incredibly talented arm that is next in line to be that good enough to survive pitcher for the Colorado Rockies. I mean, dude, if if Kyle Freeland can give you a 285 in 202 innings like he did in, in 2018, and obviously he just never got back there again. Uh, right. But again, he did it, though. And it wasn't like a total fluke. The difference is your margin for error when you are a, you know, Freeland was looking like a, a, a number. He was like a number four, number three type. And then that year he, he pitched like a, a frontline guy. Yeah. But if you are a frontline you know, or a middle rotation type that's really locked in and pitching out of your mind, like you can succeed anywhere. I think the difference is though, is the league adjusts to you, your margin for error when you pitch at cores becomes a lot thinner. And, and Kyle Freeland didn't have the stuff to, to overcome that. I, I think Dolander, when you have that kind of stuff, look, there might not be, it might not be sub three or, or sub four every single year. There might be some stretches where it's tough because that's what, where I think cores mounts on you is when you are not right, it's going to really amplify you not being right. Like when you have to start to rely on the fastball more uh, because your secondaries aren't there uh, and guys start to put it in play more. Well, it's the most cavernous outfield in baseball. The ball carries more like you, your, your struggles are going to be magnified. I don't think that it suppresses success as much as people think, because we look at the numbers over the course of a whole season and we say, oh, wow, no one's had a good season here for so long. But you've had stretches. There's guys that will go there and dominate. Yeah. So I do think Dolander is capable of doing that. And what I love is that he is the perfect fit to be able to handle that. He talked about the mental side being so important for him and how, you know, I think at Tennessee this final year, he was not great at letting, at limiting the pitch before in terms of its impact on the next pitch. So, hey, I didn't execute this pitch before, not letting it impact the next pitch. Every pitch is in a vacuum. I'm focused on executing that individual pitch. If I didn't do it the one before, I don't care. Turn the page, next pitch. I think that's one of the major keys to course field, to be honest. You execute a fastball and some guy you gets a BS home run to right field. Are you going to trust to go to that fastball again in the same spot? You should. And it sounds like Dolander will. So I think the mental part of course field is, is another area where it probably gets understated. And, and I think that's where Dolander will be able to handle it. Talking more about just about Dolander real quick. First two starts in Spokane, which is not a good place to pitch, right? No, not a good not place at all. At all. Um, well, one was in, or one was in Spokane. The other was in tri city. He's pitched 10 innings so far. One earned run came on a solo shot. That's it. And, and, and it was a 101 mile an hour home run. Uh, that I don't know if it would have got out at, at a lot of other places. 15 punches, four walks, and it's just been, I think, fantastic when you look at it. And the thing that stood out the, the most to me was he walked three in the first outing, walks just one in his in his last outing. And any time he kind of missed, because he talks about he was pulling too hard with his glove side, and he went into detail about how that affected him. You could just see where, okay, you know, I pulled too hard with the glove side here, arm popped up a little bit. He would recalibrate, execute the next pitch. So when you're seeing a guy that's doing exactly what he said he was going to do and kind of executing exactly what he said he found to be an issue um, before the season, it's pretty easy to subscribe to the belief that, you know, this guy's got things clicking and I think it's going to work at the highest level for him too. Especially when you build in the fact that he has a deep arsenal now, the added adjusted curveball, the changeup he feels like can be as good as his slider then the slider we know is dominant. And then the fastball from that lower, you know, three quarter release, that's going to play anywhere. I don't care. Yeah. hundred percent. Question number six, what prospects are really on make or break seasons when determining their value moving forward? That comes from new freed eight on Instagram. We'll try, you know, we'll keep that kind of focused on the top 100. Since it's the top 100 mailbag. Um, I'm curious what you've got, Jack, and then I'll kind of chime in on a couple of the names that I am looking at. Uh, but I know you have a few kind of ready to go. And I think the way we interpreted this question was, you know, these are prospects that with a bad first half or with a bad season 
you know, our, our perspective on them could drastically shift. Whereas if you have a, I'm trying to look at like, let's say, I'm trying to give an example here, but let's say like, uh, I'm trying to find like a good, Noah Schultz, let's say Noah Schultz struggles. I don't know if my perspective is changing Mm -hmm. enough for him to fall off the list because he just hasn't had enough run. Uh, But somebody else that we might mention, you know, it may validate some of the concerns. I think what it ends up boiling down to is what am I worried about with this prospect? And have they eliminated that concern enough or did they validate that concern enough to where, uh uh-oh, I got to, I got to adjust accordingly. Yeah. I I also kind of looked at it as guys that could be considered one of, if not the best prospect in their specific organization. And if like you put together a year where it just doesn't work, are you, are you willing to give them that get out of jail free card this year? Like kind of, kind of same thing that you're saying, but in another way of like, are you an elite elite prospect right now that if you have a bad year, you fall from that level of thinking. Mm-hmm. And I grabbed five guys that I texted you. Marcelo Meyer strictly because I'm curious to see how he bounces back from that injury laden 2023 season. If Meyer struggle struggles in Portland this year, I do think that like we have to look at Roman Anthony as the better pro- prospect. I know you already do view Roman Anthony as the better prospect, but, but that's not universal thinking. Yeah. It's not universal thinking. I think that, you know, we could end this year seeing Kyle Teal as a better prospect than Roman Anthony. And, and that's the way I kind of looked at it. Like I don't you think mean Meyer or, or Roman. Uh, uh, Meyer. Okay. Yeah. Meyer yeah. Is, is a better prospect. Yeah. Which is no very possible. Very possible. I will say though, Meyer off to a good start, which is great yeah. to see. Healthy, um, aggressive still, but he's hitting the ball. Mm-hmm. Crushed a home run to dead center already. Uh, 357, 387, 500 through the start. But I think it's a great point. Like I, if, if he struggles, yeah, I think we're, and, and Teal's performing. Yeah, I think all of a sudden, not only, I mean, we already had Roman ahead, like you mentioned, but all of a sudden, you know, you could be looking at Teal as a guy ahead of him because, hey, they're at the same level. Um, you know, Teal being a, a good defensive catcher now and uh, having a, a pretty high floor with the field to hit. Yeah, that, that can change a lot of things. So, yeah, it's good to see Meyer off to a good start. But if if he was, you know, chasing a ton, still whiffing, not walking, um, yeah, he'd, he'd, be, he'd be a guy that would validate my concerns and would would start to sink a little bit. I mean, people were, were you know, giving us a little bit of flack for – and, and he's just the one guy that I feel like we always get flack for, for having him at 30. Um, yeah. But, you know, we had him at 30 because of some of the concerns. That's still really high. Uh, but, you know, I think not high enough for some Red Sox fans. I get it. But if, you know, if he keeps if, – if he doesn't look healthy or looks like, you know, the, the injury wasn't enough of a explanation, then, yeah, that's a guy that falls. Who else do you have? I've got Mick Abel with the Phillies. Mick Abel's another guy where I need to see him not walk people for an entire year. Mm-hmm. And last year, it it feels like for me, the way that I perceive Abel is, this is the last year that I can really view him as a project. Yep. You know what I mean? It. I think the project label goes away because he'll spend the entire year between double and triple A. Mm-hmm. Like that, that's my big thing. So if, if he still looks like he's struggling and he still looks like a young guy that's got to figure it out before he gets to the big leagues, there are people that are younger than him that are beating him to the big leagues at that point. And, and that is probably when Abel starts to slide. Now I know you love the fastball changes that he made over the off season, but you know, we'll see, like he can't walk five guys per nine this year. Just can't. No. And, and he's had two starts in triple A. The first one was a disaster. Um, okay. Ending in two thirds, he walked four. And then this last start was better against Durham. He went six innings or five innings, six hits, four earned runs, but only two walks, five Ks. I'm with you, man. Like he's been a very difficult player to peg for me. Yeah. But a guy that we kind of boosted up a little bit, uh, kind of at the 11th hour when I saw some of the adjustments with his release and some of the fastball characteristics. And then, you know, him seeing him look like he was repeating his mechanics more consistently. It's early, not going to overreact to, you know, six and two thirds innings, but you know, this is a guy that if it's another season, as you mentioned, of just the command not being there, I'm going to start to wonder if it's ever going to be there at that point. Like this is the year where it's like, okay, if the command doesn't kick in, this is just going to be the kind of guy that he's going to be. And and it's just going to be a lot of walks, 
and you got to hope you can strike out the world and, and, you know, escape jams uh, and, and, and limit, you know, limit the hard contacts because he's going to always be putting himself at a disadvantage. And I'm worried that that might be the case. But I, again, if he comes out and shoves this year, he's a guy that flies up the ranks if he's filling up the zone. But if not, he could have a, you know, a kind of a weight to him. Yeah, kind of same deal with Connor Phillips of the Cincinnati Reds. He just yeah. needs to throw strikes. Like he falls into the same bucket. Yep. Two more guys I've got for you. Um, AJ Smith Shaver of the Braves. I'm worried that he's Vaughn Grissom 2.0, where he got fast yeah. tracked. He looked so good. He looked like the future of that Braves rotation. And then he really struggles in AAA. And Grissom was really good in AAA last year. And that's why he was the return for Chris Sale to Boston. Mm -hmm. But AJ, through his first two starts, has been miserable. He survived a grand total of three innings in his first two starts. So AJ might be a guy that the industry as a whole looks at if he has a four and a half, five ERA this year in AAA. And, you know, Strider's down. Like, who knows if Freed's going to be healthy the whole year? Who knows if Sale's going to be healthy the whole year? If they go to Dodd and they go to Elder and they keep going to Vines and Winans and they're not going to AJ because he's really struggling in Gwinnett, we might have to look in the mirror at some point this yeah. year and be like, did we get too high on him too quickly? Yeah, well, he's such a tough one because, I mean, what he was doing relative to his, you know, age and level and, and what we saw even a high That's A true. and a double yeah. A, crazy stuff. And then even in triple A before the, the, the call up, I don't know what's happened. Uh, I don't know if he's been, you know, adjusting too much to try to survive at the big league level and now kind of getting away from who he is. But it's just been weird to see him go back to triple A and struggle the way that he has. And the stuff is playing well in terms of, when it's around the zone, it's a lot of whiff, but I mean, this guy, he hasn't had the change up at all. Uh, I know it's only two starts, but you throw, he needs that change up because that was something that I felt like was kind of going to be going to be that differentiator for him. He's trying to throw it even more as he added that, you know, as kind of an added focus for him going into this year, he's throwing it more than a slider and he's throwing more balls than strikes when going to that change up. So I don't know if he's out there just trying to focus and work on that, but he might have to start leaning back on the slider more but that slider was kind of inconsistent for him at times. And it's just been general command, to be honest. Uh, he has a strike rate of 57%. So oh. I'm with you. He's 21 years old, but you know, he's kind of at this point now where, you know, he's not going to have that traditional prospect climb. And, you know, if he's not doing it in triple a, he's going to start to slip a little bit. And, and we've preached the, to be patient with him because of the way that he's been rushed and has been dealt a tough hand. But at the same time, like it's going to be impossible to keep him ahead of some of the other pitching prospects that we have ahead of him be if, if they're throwing well and he continues to falter in triple A because like they're not going to send him back down to double to dominate. Maybe that's a little unfair to him. And that's always something that we try to, you know, remind people when it comes to kind of understanding how to assess these players. Like Drew Thorpe's two years older and Drew Thorpe's still in double A. But if Drew Thorpe yeah. goes up to triple A and, and is doing exactly what he's been doing so far in double. Why wouldn't he jump two spots in our top 100 and, and, and jump over AJ Smith Shaver at 56? Right. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it there's becomes a point to where this command uh, slump, I guess you would call it, yeah, becomes such a long, you know, prolonged stretch that it's going to become hard to ignore. And you got to wonder, you know, what's going on. Yeah. And then the last guy I've got for this is Everson Pereira. Yeah. It's just time for him to be a major leaguer. It's not going to happen in that Yankee outfield, especially with Dominguez coming back at the All Star break. Like, I don't. It's tough. He he feels like the easiest trade target ever. And you know, if they need starting pitching help, their bullpen is clearly amazing. If they need any help, they should move Pereira. And it's time for Pereira to be like too good for AAA. And frankly, through two weeks, he has been too good for AAA. We'll just we'll see what happens. He has been, and then he's also just been frustrating because, like, you know, he looks like he's dominating. He's setting a ton of homers. He looks super comfortable. And then all the time. Yeah. Last six at bats, he's 0 for six with six punches. Ugh. So it's just, it's like the frustration there. And again, that my con the concern with Everson Pereira is he going to hit enough? And that was always the question, but he's a top 100 prospect because the EVs are elite and he elevates. And it's really hard to argue against that kind of batted ball data. I'm going to roll the dice on those types of players. Again, not in the top 50 but I'm going to roll the dice on that type of player, you know, in the back end of the top 100 when you got that kind of power. And, um, you know, we've just seen him absolutely pulverize baseballs. He's improved the walk rate, but I'm with you. Like if you're going to strike out at a 30 something percent clip in triple a, 
even without getting that big league opportunity, like I'm going to start to, to become worried. Like he needs to be a guy that, yeah, he's going to get up to the big leagues and he's going to be a 30% strikeout guy. That's fine. But you got to show in triple a that, Hey, I'm not letting these guys punch me out at 30%. Like I, I'm going to handle this just fine. And so far he hasn't been that so far. He's been more of the three true outcome, you know, punish mistakes. And those guys in triple a don't translate. So I am, you know, that is something that I am worried about. And I think you hit the nail on the head, you know, with, with, with each of those guys in terms of, you know, how they could go one way or another and, and how that maybe impacts their stock. Yeah. One or two other names for me and a guy that's already off to a great start. So kind of answering it, but you know, this question was kind of asked in both directions, right? Like determining their value make or break on the make side is Tink Hens. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if, if Tink Hens struggled this year, this would be another one of those where it's like, okay, we're talking about some finger issues and he had some other weird ailments last year. And also it was like, okay, it was the first time he was really stretched out. You know, maybe there's just some things that uh, he has to work through. We'll see how he bounces back the next year. But if the struggles continued this year, as he's finally throwing more than three innings at a time, I'd start to say, oh no, maybe he's not you know, built for this. That has not been the case at all, by the way. He has been phenomenal. He's been awesome. His, awesome and tangibly different. He's been commanding everything through his first two starts, 10 innings, 11 punchies, one earned run, uh, only three hits, one walk. And when you look across the arsenal, the fastball, he is confident in it. It is jumping out of his hand again. There's just more life on it. Uh, the breaking ball has been disgusting. The problem for him was it was inconsistent for him. Uh, this year, he's landing at first strike so far uh, almost 70% of the time. The changeup hasn't been there quite as much as you'd like to see it, but it's been there more than last year. And that's, the most important thing. And so he's got this three pitch mix that, you know, he's really confident in now. And he looks like the guy that we saw in short spurts at the lower levels, but he's doing it over 80 pitches, 94 and a half mile an hour average fastball velocity in that last start where he threw 82 pitches. Like that's huge to see. And the start before that he was averaging 96. So, yeah. I mean, it, it, I think he is on that make side where we can mm -hmm. really see him have a ton of helium, but if he struggled, you know, he probably would have been a guy that could have slipped off the top 100 list. For sure. I mean, I guess in that breath, you should probably throw Waldrop in there too. Uh -huh. Like Waldrop is a guy that could, you know, really make it. Although Waldrop has been terrible in double A to open the year. So I, I've got yeah. no idea what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. That would, uh, I mean, he was another one. I just uh, didn't know where to peg him. We threw him on at a at hundred and we'll see the fastball quality is concerning. So yeah, he's not one of those guys that's been around for a while. But yeah. he's one of those guys that's supposed to be close to a finished product, already has the big league 70 pitch right. with the splitter. So, like, he should be taking care of business. Um, and time. if the fastball is continuing to get pummeled the way it was getting pummeled in college, yeah, I'm I'm worried. And he's definitely falling off the top 100 list after being at 100. So, I think Waldrop, yeah, in that same breath is, is definitely someone that you can throw into that grouping. I'm trying to think of like anyone else. I, I think the one other name would be, and we talked about like the trend of Aurelvis Martinez, and that's why he has climbed for us. But if Aurelvis fell flat this year, then I'd be like, oh shoot, maybe those changes didn't help as much as we thought. Um, mm -hmm. I think the Blue Jays have a good one here, and and I'm not too worried about it um, because I I love the changes and the trend that we saw. But if all of a sudden he took a step backwards. There's been too much swing and miss and approach issues and defensive limitation for me to say, oh, well, what about last year? Last year was so good. I'll probably say, ooh, well, maybe they adjusted to him in last year. You know, I don't know if that's going to hold more weight than this current year and all of the years before that. So I could see Arelvis being a guy that if he really struggled would slip, but I'm not expecting that to happen at all. And I'm not overly concerned about him. I got one more for you, actually. Kevin Alcantara. Mm -hmm. That's the name, I think. If Kevin Alcantara stinks this year, or even, you know what, like if he is just like, meh, I can't do it anymore. I can't yep. do the like freak tools and then yep. meh for like every single year. Like, so if he is just league average again, I, I'm going to, he's going to start to slip. Like, I love that. I mean, job. You've said it. You've said it. Like, when are we going to see the freak? We haven't, we've seen flashes. If we see another year where it's like a hundred WRC plus and yeah, I know he's ended up finishing better than that. But if we have another year where it's just nothing jumps off the page, I, I'm I'm gonna run out of patience. I know he's still young, but he's had a lot of at bats. I'm gonna start yeah. to run out of patience. Yes. Question number seven. 
This comes from Big League Analysis on Instagram. You should definitely go check out. That's our guy Peyton. Does a great job editing for us. Does basically, all the clips that you see, that's Peyton, but also has a robust account himself on TikTok and on Instagram called Big League Analysis. Yeah. What prospect could you see sneaking their way to the big leagues this year and making an impact on the top 100 list? It's a great question. And emphasis on the word sneak. So like they, you know, it needs to be somebody that I think maybe yeah, it could be a highly regarded prospect, but maybe that people didn't have penciled in as, you know, every time you're going into a season, you say, Oh, well, they've got this rotation or they've got this lineup, but they've got this guy knocking on the door. So yes. it, it's basically a guy that nobody really said it was knocking on the door. No one in Norfolk. No one. Yeah. So no one in Norfolk. Um, really none of the guys that had a 2024 ETA, I would say for the most part, like it'd yeah. be most of the guys that had a 2025 ETA that I said, Oh, well, you know, they could probably still get up sometime this year. Yeah. Um, who comes to mind for you? I've got five. Two I'll of fill them in whatever. Yeah, I'll fill in wherever I think you know you didn't cover, but I'm sure you're going to hit the names that I would have been thinking too. Yeah, so I've got five. Two of them are hitters in AAA. Jace Young is the one that could go either way. Like you could think, oh, you got you got him waiting in the wings, but I think a lot of Tigers fans viewed Colt Keith as that guy that was up next, and Young was kind of a down the road thing. Young is kicking ass in AAA right now, and that offense needs a jolt. I think Jace Young could be that guy to give him a jolt. I think a lot of Cubs fans looked at Matt Shaw as a guy mm -hmm. that could slot in at third base. And I will throw Matt Shaw out there, but nobody really factors in Owen Casey to the 2024 plans. And yeah. Owen Casey is lighting the world on fire in AAA right now. Mm -hmm. So halfway Shaw, but all the way in Casey – I think Owen Casey is a guy that's going to beat his ETA because AAA was like, it made a ton of sense because he spent the entire year in double last year. But, you know, you think about Iowa and going into this year, it was like, oh, PCA is going to be there, just kind of waiting for his big league shot. And then, oh, Matt Shaw is going to start in Tennessee, but then he's going to get up to Iowa and then he'll be waiting for his big league shot. I feel like there wasn't really a conversation about Owen Casey on that front. And I, I think Casey no. is one of those guys. I think it's a great one. I mean, because Casey's the kind of guy that you bring him up, you put him just against righties in that DH slash outfield spot. He's gonna kill. He's going to crush balls. He might strike out a ton. Who cares? You know, if he's like a late season call up that you platoon and put in positions yeah. of success, he can give you some rare thump at the bottom of your order and he'll draw walks and he's turned into a decent defender in the corner. I love the Casey shot, obviously, you know, um, that's a guy that we think. Yeah. Guy going into the year could could end up being a sneaky sneaky ad. Anyone else you got? I've got two draft guys from last year. Rhett Louder has started the year in Dayton, which is high A. Um, I think Louder could be one of those guys that just shoots up quickly, and he could be starting games for the Reds in the midst of a wild card chase. Yes. So Louder is a guy that that jumped out to me. Kyle Teal is another one. Like the Red Sox offense is anemic at this point, and we've long talked about that catching tandem not being good enough. Teal's raking in double, just do it. And then TK Roby with the Cardinals, they're going to need some innings. Tink and TK Roby are both in Springfield right now. Yeah. Um, I think Tink, they're going to baby a little bit more mm -hmm. because they've been babying him. But Roby, who they got as part of that Montgomery deal with Thomas Sejazi, another guy who could get up this year. Um, but I don't know where the space is for Sejazi. I can tell you where the space is for TK Roby. And I think that Roby could be that guy. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I was looking at Roby and T Tink Hentz, and I think Hentz is looks more ready right now. And but I also had the same thought of like, oh yeah, but they might rather just you know throw Roby up there. I think Hentz could be a guy that they say, hey, let's not waste that many more bullets. He's already stretched out to eighty five pitches. Like if he's dominating in double, and we've seen like they don't you know a lot of teams are pretty comfortable bringing guys up from the Texas league. Like if you can pitch in the Texas league, like we'll, we'll bring you up. If Hence is filling up the zone, I, I wouldn't be shocked though. I do have the concern of, are they just going to continue to baby him? But I think they might be at the point where the training wheels are off and we're kind of mm -hmm. seeing that. So that's, that was the, one of the first names that came to mind for me. Um, you know, the, there's the obvious Tyler black, but again, I think that's more of like an obvious, we kind of thought he could almost, Know, break into the uh, opening day roster if if you know some things shook out a certain way and uh, ultimately that's not how it went. But kind of just like looking across, 
there's a few different names. I think the louder shout was great because he's a dude that uh, I think is like the peak of why waste the bullets. He could go get outs now. He's not yeah. a finished product from the respect that he's going to kind of learn how his arsenal plays at the big league level. But I think he's only going to learn that at the big league level. Like yeah. he's going to get guys out in double and in triple really easily um, because I, maybe not triple as much, but especially high A and double because he can mix four pitches for a strike and pinpoint them. And like, it's just, it looks like he's like throwing bullpens out there a little bit through these first two starts. It was fun to watch both of them, but it's like nine innings so far. He's given up one earned run. He's punched out 10. He's walked two and he's just kind of massaging his way through lineups and just executing so well. So that's a guy that could come up. And even if he's not a finished product, will give you quality starts, I think uh, as well as anybody, but yeah. looking at like to try to add some other names into the fold, if, how desperate do the Phillies have to be if McAble's throwing well to bring him up? He's already in Triple A. If they have an injury or two, I wouldn't be shocked if they go that direction. If he starts throwing better over the yep. next handful of starts, because it's another guy like, yeah, the command's frustrating, but maybe big league pitching coach, maybe that's something that starts to get put together there at that level. Um, Chase Hampton with the Yankees, yeah. I, the Yankees rotation is in a good spot right now overall, relatively speaking, because they're going to get Garrett Cole back and Hampton so far, I think is banged up. That's the, that's the challenge, mm -hmm. but Will Warren has looked rough. Um, yeah. They've traded a lot of their pitching depth. And I, I think with Hampton's fastball and just the feel for his secondaries, that could be a guy that they, you know, if they're in a pinch, I think could get up there and, and help them. Yeah. Um, you gave me a hesitant. Yeah. Yeah, it's so tough because the, the standard for a Yankee starter is just so high. And I know that they've run out some runs of the litter recently, but it, for them to call up their top pitching prospect to start for them, while we could very well be looking at them as the best team in baseball, it's, it's just a very high bar to clear. And yeah. call it the Yankee way if you want. I'm just like, I don't know. I hear... Hampton gets up and cracks into the back end of the Yankee rotation. It's just, it's tough for me to believe it because like, I, I almost think it's more likely they trade him this year for, for help than, than they actually like call him up this year for help. That's fair enough. Uh, and then I'm trying to think of like, you know, I, I could cite any like white Sox arm, like Thorpe yeah, and Iriarte sure, will like, get up. There. You know, you're expecting Iriarte to get up this year. You're yeah. expecting Drew Thorpe to make a start at the end of the year, like that kind of thing. I'll say, I mean, I don't know what the pirate situation is, but I wouldn't be shocked if Bubba Chandler forces his way up there. So Chandler was a very interesting one to me, and I thought about putting him down because Chandler has looked really good in double A mm -hmm. at this point. He walked what I think last start he walked his first two guys that he saw on nine pitches, and then after that, cruised through like five innings and 50 pitches. It was insane. Yeah. Um, yeah. No hints. Chan Chandler's a tough one because, assuming health, Keller, Jones, Skeens as the front three Marco is on the IL. They're not too worried about that. Martin Perez has been throwing the ball. Well, does Bubba Chandler make another major league start before Quinn Priester makes a major league start? It's very tough. Like there's a lot of yeah. parts there. Um, and not to mention, you've got Josh Fleming and Luis Ortiz that are ready to make spot starts and Rolanzi yeah. Contreras is ready to go long. There might be too much traffic yeah, to warrant starting Chandler's clock. That's fair enough. And that's probably um, kind of the situation there. And then Christian Scott, just call that guy up yeah. tomorrow. Like, yeah. please. I, there's no point in, in having him in AAA any longer. Last but not least, with 10 prospects graduating soon, or with like 10 prospects graduating yeah. soon, who are names we should expect to see replace them? That comes from Kyle Stelter78 on Twitter, another very enjoyable uh, person to interact with. Yes. You kind of have some of the names, like the just misses, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more in another episode. Um, yeah. But we'll kind of talk about some of those just misses and then maybe some other names that um, you know could also play their way into the conversation. Uh, but you want to kind of walk us through some of the just misses and I'll fill in where ne when needed? Yeah, so the two Ariases, Roderick Arias with the Yankees and Rainer Arias with the Giants, mm -hmm. two guys that are really young that mashed at, you know, Roderick was at the complex last year. He had a 143 WRC plus. Rainer Arias was at the DSL for the Giants. Yeah, and, and dominating before a wrist issue and then He's got crazy. option and like an op opportunity to play more and, you know, on the backfields and really showed out there. 
Yeah. Uh, Dylan Beavers with the Baltimore Orioles is another interesting one. Um, Cam Collier with the Reds has gotten off to a great start. Yeah. I think Collier could make his way back. We'll see. And and we talked about it. Like, I, I think a lot of people, everyone dropped him off the list, but I, I heard from some folks that, like, he wasn't even close. And I thought that there was a little bit, I think people were a little too harsh on Collier. And I think we're seeing that out of the gate now that, you know, guy can hit. So that's definitely another good name to watch. Yeah. A couple others. Thomas White, left hander with the Marlins. Thomas mm-hmm. White could jump on. Meyer is struggling. Um, I don't know how White Meyer, doing so far. Yeah. Thomas White's been great. Noble Meyer has not been good <laughs> out of the gate. It's so early, but Thomas White has looked fantastic. That was yeah. a guy that was very close to making it. And then a couple others. We got a bunch of upper minors guys that we're going to highlight in the, in the just missed article that's coming out a little bit later this week, but two Dodgers as well. Tyrone Lorenzo, catcher who's in high A right now. And then Yoandri Vargas, who's an infielder. I think he's in Rancho at this point. Yeah. And then of course, Zaire Hope. Yeah, I mean, Zaire, Hope. Zaire Hope's now on that on that short list as well of guys that could easily make their way on as we get a little bit larger of a sample in that Dodgers system. I've got one more question for you because our social media czar on the call up front, Elijah Evans, texted in the group and said, fire question for the mailbag. And then Peyton said, I looked at the list after seeing this and it's such an interesting cutoff. So the question is from Matt Flakes 10 on Instagram. Is there anyone outside of the top 60 right now you see having a reasonable chance to be a number one prospect in baseball? <laughs> oh my God. It's a very tough one, but I love the question. And I'm just uh, going to throw names at you and you say in some alternate universe, yes or no, no shot. He, he's also that guy, whoever had a great question. I lo- the cutoff is great because it goes from like Tamar Johnson, who obviously is very far off, but like is so freaky and like you could just talk yourself into anything to Thomas or Jay-Z, which yeah. is like there's no world where he's <laughs> where he's up there. You'd have to hit 500 in Triple A. No, so like guys that are young, I'm thinking of guys that are and young. My, it has to right be a young way. guy. It has to be a guy that's far off, and it has to be a guy that has freakazoid potential. Um, so like there's gonna be prospects I like more than those guys that are the answer is gonna be no. Uh, yeah. Because like they just can't ever get there. So um, right. just disclaimer there. So guys in the lower minors that are outside the top 60, I'm going to run you through. Noah Schultz, no, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, he's a left hand. He's pitcher. been awesome, but yeah. I'm he's not, been awesome, no, but no, I don't think so. I'm never going to have a pitcher number one. It's going to take some either bad hitting crop or just. Yeah. yeah. L- Luis Lara with the Milwaukee Brewers is 19 and high A. Can't do it. He doesn't have no. juice. No. Sebastian Walcott with the Rangers. That's the first possible answer. Yeah. Just because he could have that junior Camonero track. And, and he could he could do that with maybe even a little bit more athleticism. Um, yeah. Walcott is is a reasonable possibility. So one that I think is reasonable too is Arjun Namala with the Blue Jays. Yes, because of how young he is. He doesn't have as much of the freakazoid, like, you know, aspects of like a, a Walcott who, you know, could hit 40 home runs, but Namala can run into some power. He can play great defense. He's fast. Um, that's, I think a little bit less likely, but also in the conversation. Yeah. And then there are a couple other guys that like, I don't think can get there. Like Kevin McGonigal doesn't have the tools to be a number one prospect in the no. game. Um, Lazaro Montes is a DH. No. Um, Bryce Eldridge is probably a first baseman. No. Dylan Head is an interesting name. If he grows into more power, he can become that dynamic center field prospect. But like, it's really hard. I think the two answers to this are Walcott and Amala. I have one that is like needle in a haystack probability, but just one fire from the hip guy. Jefferson Rojas from uh-huh. the Cubs. Just because he's so young and already so good. And we're, I mean, we're the only ones that had him on the top 100 list. And I think that I, by midseason, you're going to see him on every single list. This guy put up good numbers in low A as a 17 slash 18 year old. Now he's 18. He doesn't turn 19 for another 10 days in high A. And he's slashing 314, 351, 543, uh, playing great defense, striking out less than 20% of the time. If he is a kind of tools across the board shortstop with polish ahead of his years, who's mashing, uh, like this guy could get to double A as a 19 year old yeah, and like put in and then, you know, starts next year in double a as a 19 year old and is putting up monster numbers. It's, it's again, it's far fetched, but of any of the names where it's like, I can't, I won't say 0.0% chance. I'm not going to say like, there's absolutely no chance. 
Jefferson Rojas is the one that can have like the 0.001% chance out of, out of the rest of that group. But that shows you, I mean, once you get outside of the top 50, all these guys have the ch a chance to be all-stars, but that, that upside tapers off pretty dramatically. That was an awesome question though. That was a great question. So wanted to include that. That'll do it for this episode. Uh, we will be talking about the Mets prospects later this week and have a lot of other fun stuff uh, in store on the show. Be sure to keep up with our Twitter and our Instagram. We're consistently tweeting out highlights of all of the top performers, all the top prospects in the minor leagues, uh, our social media czar, uh, Elijah Evans, doing a great job over there. Um, so if you would just want to keep up with what's going on in the minors, be sure to follow us you know, at, on at the call up pod on Twitter, as well as Instagram. And I really appreciate everybody who has left a rating, helped us grow the show, subscribe to the YouTube. That'll do it. We will talk prospects with you on Wednesday.